Grandpa stole his first buggy in 1892. Uh, I met your grandma pig slopping in 46. Oh, every Christmas we visit my Uncle Fred in prison. And welcome, America, to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. It's our 10th anniversary show. I cannot believe it. And I am so excited today to have as a guest for two segments, your DNA guide, Diane Southard. And Diane's going to be talking about the history of genetic genealogy, how she got started in all this, because she started like before almost anybody you can think of. And then we're going to talk about where are we going? What's still to come? Apparently, there's a lot more, and you're going to find out about that a little later on in about 10 minutes with Diane. Right now, it's time to head out to Boston, where my good friend David Allen Lambert is standing by, the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. Hello, David. Happy decennial anniversary, my friend. Can you believe it? I mean, 10 years. We started this thing... Uh, in July of 2013, on a single radio mm-hmm. station in Salt Lake City, Utah, and yeah. then we went national in January of 2014, and now we're on in markets like yours in Boston and Washington mm-hmm. and Atlanta and Dallas and uh, still Salt Lake and a lot of other markets as well. What a ride. And, gee, I can only thank everybody who's been so supportive of all this from the beginning. It's just amazing. The following just continues to grow. You know, I've had the honor of being on the show off and on now for eight years. Oh, yeah. So, um, Mostly on, yeah. Dave. <laughs> That's true. Well, you know, there's times I've been kind of off, but <laughs> <laughs> glad to be on with Family History News anytime you need it. So. Well, that's great. Let's get started on that then. What do we have to begin with? Well, a combination of the efforts of the Public Record Office in Northern Ireland and our friends at Ancestry now have online for free 3.2 million names indexed from the Northern Ireland valuation records from the period of 1864 to 1933. And as we all know, Irish research is so hard to do anyways because of the fires. And to have this online is going to make a lot of breakthroughs for genealogists doing Ireland. Thank you, Prony and Ancestry. Well, and you know, the Irish government is recognizing what a boon genealogy is to tourism there. So they're getting behind it. And a lot of good things are happening in Ireland. Stanford University researchers have undertaken some research on African-American ancestry. They are now doing research that takes traditional measurements of genetic ancestry and yields new investigations as to European percentage and African ancestry. A fascinating story and available from Stanford.edu. Well, you know, I think there's a lot of fun when people go out with metal detectors, but how about if you're just out planting in your field and you find a gold coin? That's pretty lucky. Yeah. Maybe two, even more lucky. How about 700 and still (laughs) finding them? A man in Kentucky has found a hoard of pre-1863 gold coins from $20 gold pieces worth six figures all the way to $1 gold coins. It's amazing. 95% of these fish are gold. Yeah, and he's still digging them up. This is the thing. Mm -hmm. And he's putting up videos of him just pulling them out of the ground. The coin collecting world, their heads are exploding right now. (laughs) They don't know what to make of this. And it's typical during the Civil War that families would bury fortunes with the idea that they'd go back because maybe they had to flee because the Union forces were coming or they're worried about neighbors burning down their farms, etc. So it's, it's an interesting bit of history. But wow, I think he paid for his property. Yeah, I think that's covered. You know, Fish, in the past, we've talked about the Clotilda that was discovered in Alabama. That was the last slave ship. It was a schooner that carried over 110 men, women, and children. And they're bringing up pieces of it right now. Pieces of wood that are being preserved and also metal are being displayed at the Africatown Heritage House. Yeah, this is an interesting thing because they've got to bring this out very gently or it all just falls apart because it's been soaking for, what, 160 years, something Mm -hmm. like that. So there's a real technique to this, to preserving this thing. We'll see how much of it they can bring out and successfully restore. You know, it goes to show you that there's treasure in many ways. The 700 gold coins is treasure, but this is also historical treasure. Oh, yeah. And we lost a lot of treasure 50 years ago. 
and this fire took place in St. Louis, Missouri, July 12th, 1973. 17 million documents went up in smoke. Wow. Yeah, there's a great article on that right now from Wired.com, and they talk about the day that it happened. They actually interview people who were interning there at the time and actually found the thing before it really got out of control. But nonetheless, there was so much material in there that it just kept going and going. It took them days to get the fire out. And this was a tragedy that still echoes to today because there were 17,500,000 records of service people, mostly soldiers and Air Force people from the 20th century up to that point, 1973. Mm -hmm. So it covered all the way from like right after the Spanish-American War, all the way through World War II, all the way through Vietnam. And uh, it's been a disaster ever since. But it talks about the number of people that they have on board who are working to restore a lot of these documents whenever they're requested. I mean, they have so many of them, they obviously aren't just going to work on all of them only when they're requested. So what they're doing, they've got this new technology that can actually take a piece of blackened paper and Mm -hmm. get the information out of it. Of course, a lot of that was thrown away back in the day because nobody ever imagined that any of those things were restorable, but they are. Terrible loss, especially Mm -hmm. for those service people who are trying to get the benefits they so justly deserved. We were so lucky that there were some records preserved on the state, like the DD-214s, the Adjutant General offices yep. have held, because most of us wouldn't be able to research our World War One, World War Two related family members after they're gone, because unless the family kept the papers, <laughs> St. Louis lost most of them. Exactly. But it's great they're able to preserve these and move forward, and it is almost like what's going on in Ireland with the four courts, where they're trying to recreate what was there from the fires of 1922. Interesting. Well, that's all I have from Beantown this week for you, but I invite people to join American Ancestors and save $20 if you use the coupon code EXTREME on AmericanAncestors.org. All right, David, catch you at the back end of the show for Ask Us Anything. And coming up next on our 10th anniversary show, your DNA guide, Diane Southard, talking about the history of genetic genealogy. How did we get to where we are today? And also, where are we going? And a lot more coming up next when we return in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Are you stuck in your genealogy research, frustrated by those brick walls that just won't budge, or confused by DNA test results and don't know where to begin? The experts at Legacy Tree Genealogists are here to help you find your missing ancestors and complete your family tree. With over 18 years of experience, Legacy Tree has assisted clients in every state and nearly every country worldwide. We have a vast network of on-site researchers, so no matter where your roots lie, we can work to uncover the answers you seek. Picture the thrill of making that long-awaited connection, finally discovering the missing link to your relatives. That's the joy Legacy Tree brings to countless clients just like you. Whether you're a beginning or seasoned researcher, brick walls happen. But with Legacy Tree by your side, that aha moment is within reach. Visit LegacyTree.com to learn more about how to work with Legacy Tree genealogists. Put your family history in our hands, and together, we'll unlock the stories of your past. Get started today at LegacyTree.com. Hi, Genies. Fisher here, major fan of digitized newspapers. And how about a digitized newspaper site that has well over 800 million searchable pages? There is such a site. It's newspapers.com. They've got newspapers from all across the U.S., U.K., Canada, Australia, and beyond. This is where you'll find those remarkable stories, plus birth and marriage announcements, obituaries, photos, ads, and so much more. Newspapers.com is where I found my great answer marriage announcement, which was huge since her marriage was not properly recorded. And then there's the story of one relative's 50th anniversary party in 1900, with a list of all the attendees and gifts. Newspapers.com is like that box of chocolates we always hear about. You never know what you're going to get. What will you find? Sign up now at Newspapers.com. Use the coupon code EXTREME at checkout to get a special extended 20% discount on a Publisher Extra subscription. Hey, Genies. As we've dug into our family history explorations over the past year, our community at Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies has taken off. This is where you can meet like-minded genealogists who can help you break through those brick walls and find a whole city behind it occupied by ancestors 
investors whose names you don't even know yet. This is where you can learn from your fellow genies and ask questions, because many in our community have already been into some of the records you're looking for. Genealogy and Breakthrough Strategies is free. What a great place for brainstorming and getting to know other people who totally get your passion for family history research. If you're looking to take the next step in sharpening your skills, here's a great chance to learn from others and give back in areas you've already become expert in. So join us. That page again is Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. It's a long name, but we cover a lot of territory. Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. Hey, welcome back to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is our 10th anniversary show, and it's just only fitting that I have my good friend, your DNA guide, coming on the show today, Diane Souther. Diane, welcome back. It's great to have you. Scott, I am so excited to be a part of this anniversary episode. What an honor. Thank you for inviting me. Well, I'm just delighted to have you on. And, you know, when we think of extreme genes, we think of DNA. And this show has kind of ridden the wave, the tsunami of DNA testing over the years. And I thought it only made sense to talk to you today. And, you know, you think back to the beginning of all this. I mean, the DNA studies for genealogy long precedes extreme genes. I was just wondering, how did you get started? Yeah, it's actually such a fun story. You can trace this actually all the way back to my high school English teacher. Really? So my high, yes. So my high school English teacher told all of us graduating seniors that the best thing we can do in college is to find a professor who's researching something we were interested in and get involved. So I tell that to all the graduating seniors that I know also, because it literally has shaped the path of my entire life. That one piece of advice, (laughs) because wow. Yeah, I wanted to do something with DNA and genetics. That's always been my interest. And so I was at Brigham Young University. They didn't have a specific genetics department at that time. So I went to the microbiology department. I asked the secretary for a list of the professors in the department and the things they were researching, which she easily produced. And I looked down the list and it said like, bacteria and viruses. And I was like, boring, (laughs) boring. No, no, no. And then it said, Dr. Scott Woodward, archaeogenetics. Hmm. And I was like, okay, this is definitely worth investigating. So (laughs) she gave me his office location. I walked down the hallway and knocked on the door and said, hey, how can I get involved? How can I help? What are you doing? And Scott, as we call him now, of course, that was hard for me. I called him Dr. Woodward for so many years. I'll bet, but... <laughs> I'll bet, I'll bet. And he's been on this show many times because he's such a pioneer in this field. Yes, right? So I joined his lab in 1998. And in 1998, his lab was involved in identifying the mitochondrial DNA of some ancient Egyptian mummies that were buried <laughs> in a cemetery outside of Cairo, Egypt. But the cemetery was not near any towns. No one knew who these people were, and there were hundreds of burials. Really? And they, and they so, dated back yeah. how far? Uh, you know, I don't remember. Long enough. Long <laughs> enough that we were focused on teeth and femur bones. Yeah. So a group went over, excavated, brought back the bones, and it was my job in the lab to do the mitochondrial DNA typing, like figure out what their mitochondrial DNA profile was. And by doing that, we could see at least maternal relationships of individuals within the cemetery. We could see that groups of people had been buried together who were related. We could see mother-child buried together, things like that. Mm -hmm. But the problem was we could kind of see, again, how people within the cemetery were related to each other, but we still had no idea who they were. And it really was at this point that Dr. Woodward started to spread this word, like if we had a worldwide database of genetic information, we would be able to quickly and easily identify who these people were. You mean where they were from, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Where they were from, yeah. who their modern day descendants were, right? Okay. Yeah. And so that was his idea. And this idea eventually spread to Mr. James Sorensen, who was a Utah philanthropist. And he thought, well, okay, let's build it then. This database doesn't exist. Let's make it. So is this where the blood draw thing came in? Because I was part of this in like 1999. My wife and I both had our blood drawn because Dr. Woodward wanted to collect something like 100,000 samples from around the world. And I don't think he ever got that far with it because much earlier than the time that he could achieve that number, 
he proved that this whole idea would work. Absolutely. Yes. So that's what I did. While other college students were spending their weekends partying, I was traveling to nowhere, (laughs) Alabama, and giving a lecture to whoever would show up about this process and about how this could work. And after I convinced them, they lined up and actually gave blood. They stuck out their arms. We hired phlebotomists and they gave blood and their four generation family trees Mm -hmm. as you and your wife did. Yes. And then I would pack those blood samples into a cooler. I would hop back on the plane and come (laughs) back to the lab on Monday and start working. And we would extract the DNA from the blood samples and start this process of of typing them. So, yeah. That's what I did in college. And that ultimately spread to the big four now, I guess you would call it, family tree DNA and ancestry and now my heritage and, of course, 23 and me. Now, exactly. Yeah. So it's amazing. So family tree DNA. Yeah. Family tree DNA that same year in 1999, they essentially grew up at the same time as the Sorensen Foundation. So the Sorensen Foundation's goal, again, was to create this worldwide database so that we could answer all kinds of archaeology and those kinds of questions, like it was much more research-based project, yep. whereas Family Tree DNA was founded, of course, by two men who were genealogists and wanted to harness the power of this technology, namely Y-DNA, in their own family history. So really, in 1999, the first two genetic genealogy companies were born. Isn't that fascinating? And, you know, you think about that. In the beginning, as far as we genealogists went, it was Y-DNA. That was pretty much yep. it in the early yep. days. Mm-hmm. And that was what Ancestry did. I think most people don't even remember when Ancestry did Y-DNA testing in the beginning. But when autosomal came along, it changed everything. And for people who aren't familiar with that, the Y-DNA follows the DNA that is passed along father to son, father to son, on ad infinitum. But the autosomal DNA covers from the father's side all the way over to the mother's side and everything in between, which is why it's so powerful for us today. Right. And so now we have progressed to a point where in the 2000s, a lot of things started to change. They did. It, it was an explosion, really, of information. So 2007 saw our first autosomal DNA test being offered by 23 and Me. And the other companies quickly followed with similar tests. And that's really where this all really started and kind of blew wide open as far as the possibilities for family history to incorporate DNA into its everyday life, essentially. And at what point did you become your DNA guide? Was it pretty early here? Yeah. So I worked for the Sorensen Foundation up until they were sold to Ancestry. So the Sorensen Foundation and the database we had created became the foundation of Ancestry's product. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of launched them. But at that same time, I was a young mom. I had kids at home. I wasn't in a position where I wanted to work full time. And so I didn't go to work for Ancestry. And I kind of thought, well, that was a fun ride. I'll be done now (laughs) until... My two good friends who also worked for Sorensen, Ugo Perigo and Anna Swain, suggested that the three of us start a DNA education company because by this point there were enough tests out that people needed help, you know, yeah. understanding how to use these results. And so I said, okay, that's fine. And so for a couple of years, the three of us worked together, but Anna quickly got a job for Ancestry and became very involved in building their product. Ugo lived in Italy and had another full-time job. And anyway, that kind of just stopped working for us. So it really was in 2014 when I started Your DNA Guide. Wow. And I'm thinking about this because I was working with people with DNA testing as early as 2010, 2012. But at that time, it was really hard to find the key DNA matches because just not enough people had tested at that point. And you remember the big celebration when Ancestry announced that they had their one millionth test completed. Yes. It wasn't that long ago, it seems. Well, it wasn't. And it seems like the tide just kept building, you know, really quickly after that as well. It really With all the companies. And I think most of the estimates right now are somewhere around 21 million for Ancestry, which is far and above anybody else. And of course, there's a lot of overlap because there are many of us who have tested at all the companies, me being among them. And I would imagine you too. And then you can talk also about the idea here that we went from archaeology to genealogy and then to the criminal world, too, with DNA, all using the same technology. Absolutely. Isn't that amazing that we just we started with one purpose and you can see how the same technology can then be harnessed and used for a lot of different kinds of purposes. It crosses platforms and genres and 
yeah, really morphs into something you never could have imagined it would have become. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think now about 2015, 2016, it got easier and easier by that time to start getting the key matches that people needed to make the breakthroughs they were looking for. Yeah, they call that kind of the inflection point, right? It's where yeah. the technology became so much easier to use because of the size of the database that so many more people were then having success with the technology and publicizing that success, yes. which then gave other people encouragement. Oh, wow, this really works. Maybe I should try it, which means they took a DNA test, which means the database grows, which means it was even easier <laughs> to make the discovery. That's true. Now, if we could just get them to put trees together with their DNA, we'll all be very happy. We will get there. But, you know, why DNA didn't go away, mitochondrial didn't go away, and we're still seeing those all being used in combination with autosomal to make discoveries as well, even today. Absolutely. I think people often ignore the power of why in mitochondrial DNA, especially in combination with autosomal DNA, that we really have only scraped the surface of what all three tests can do together. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I know, for instance, I talked to you about this on one of your previous visits. We had a situation with my wife's uncle where he tested Y and autosomal. And the Y gave us two matches from the same couple in Pennsylvania from the mid-1700s. And then we found like 50 autosomal matches between him mm -hmm. and my wife's mother that confirmed it. And then we found a tax notice that mentioned what obviously was a son to this couple by the correct name. And so between the paper and the autosomal and the Y DNA, we could confidently conclude, yes, these were the parents of my wife's third great grandparents. I mean, it's just an amazing thing because there would have been no other way possible that we could have found these people. That's such an incredible and perfect example of how it's not just the DNA or the paper records or one kind of DNA test, but it's kind of all of these things yeah. together that really make our cases strong. Absolutely. I'm talking to Diane Southard. She's your DNA guide on my 10th anniversary show. So thrilled to have you on, Diane. Let us continue here when we return in five minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Back on our 10th anniversary show on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher here with Diane Southard, your DNA guide, as we continue our conversation about where we have been with genetic genealogy here over the last 20 years or so. And uh, Diane, I'm just think of all the remarkable discoveries we all make doing genetic genealogy. Have you got a great story that you can share for one of the things that may have surprised you a little bit? Oh, Scott, I have so many stories. <laughs> it is I know. The best part of the job is yeah. that. So one that comes to mind, I think, as people get more and more used to making discoveries and more and more used to the fact that these discoveries can be made, I still find people jumping to conclusions oh, yeah. about relationships and about decisions that their ancestors may have made and kind of casting a little bit of judgment or I don't know. It's really disheartening sometimes. And one story that kind of illustrates how we really honestly don't know what happened. Like we just, we don't know most right. of the time, right? Yeah. And we can make all kinds of assumptions and calculations or whatever, but I think we should just, I mean, I, I apply this principle in my life all the time, but just assume the best, right? So I was working with a client and she was working on her family tree, like everybody does, takes the DNA test, finds out her dad's not her dad, you know, all the things. And she's distraught and her parents are both still living. And she's coming to me wondering, do I approach them? What should I do? And I was like, well, let's see what we can find out on our own. You know, arm yourself with some information <laughs> before you go launch into your parents or whatever. And so we do this work together because that's how we do things, right? I teach somebody how to do something. They go and do it. They yes. come back to me. We work together. And so we were working in this relationship. And together, we discovered the identity of her father. And once it kind of all came out, she goes, I know that person. I know that guy. Ooh. They're like, he's like a really close family friend. And so she just, of course, assumes like everybody does that this is her mom going behind her dad's back, you know, cheating on him with this guy that they all know. And it poisoned her childhood. She just felt like all the family picnics and things they'd all done together were all just, it was terrible. Right. Yeah. And I was like, okay, but <laughs> we don't really know 
what the relationship was, what happened, all the things, right? And I said, I need you to get to a place where you can be calm and think about this. And then, you know, it is appropriate to go and talk to your parents. And so I don't know how many weeks or months went by before I heard back from her, but essentially she did summon up the courage and the peace of mind to go and talk with her parents. And it was beautiful, actually, because her parents had tried for years to have children and couldn't. And the couple, her parents, approached their family friend and said, look, we really want a baby and you're a part of our family. I mean, you're the closest friend we have. And would you do this for us? Would you be the father of our baby? And it was actually a beautiful agreement that this family had made to create her. And there was no deception. There was none of that lying or all the things she had thought, you know, none of it was. Wow. It was all actually a really beautiful arrangement between these people. Unbelievable. And so that changed everything for her, I would imagine. It does. Yes. You know? Yes. And I just, it just underscores that we don't know the story. Yeah. We, We have these pieces, right? And we can try and put together a story. And thankfully for her, there were parents still to ask, you know, most of the time we don't have the luxury of that, but you would never have thought of that scenario. No, (laughs) No, absolutely not. Wow. That's crazy. You know what I love about DNA though, is as far as genealogy goes is here's a situation in my line where a woman in Australia who's from New Zealand spit in a tube and she came up as a match to me and she matched my Wicks line. I have some third grade grandparents named Thomas Wicks and Rebecca, both from the London area. And I'd never been able to find out where Thomas was from, never found the marriage record for them, didn't have the maiden name of the mother. Well, this woman had on her tree a child named Marianne Wicks, and she was born about 1805, but up in the area of Oxfordshire. And I'm thinking, okay, that's like 35 miles northwest of London. And when I found her christening record, guess who the parents were? Thomas and Rebecca Wicks. And we had cross DNA matches through all these people. And as a result, I was able to find the maiden name, find the marriage, find the parents of both of these people. And now the line goes back a long ways and we continue to get DNA matches that confirm this connection through that couple. It's unbelievable what we can do because a woman in Australia spit in a tube. Wow. That's incredible. It really is. It never gets tiring. It never gets boring. And I just don't ever think anybody's going to look at this stuff and go, ho-hum, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Right? That's so true. So where are we going, Diane? You are your DNA guide. We are 20 years into this thing. We have seen the tsunami kind of peak in terms of testing, although there's still millions testing all the time. We estimated, what, about 30 million people have tested worldwide to this point, which helps us in so many ways, especially with ethnicity but also with genetic genealogy and with the criminal investigations as well, where they can be used. What do you see ahead? Oh, it's so exciting, isn't it? To have seen all that's happened and to know that there's still so much more that we can do. I think one of the things we actually talked about earlier, which was the combination of why mitochondrial and autosomal Mm -hmm. DNA, I think that there's a big role for that in the future as we work towards, I guess it's like a coordination, right? Because if you match someone on the autosomal DNA, again, there's so many possibilities of how you're related. But if you do or don't match on the wire mitochondrial, that also influences how you can be related to each other and either opens up or takes away a few different kinds of relationships. And I think we're we're underutilizing the power of that, which I think could be a, a big part of the future. I also think that there's power in, like you said, actually earlier also with, uh, you know, Scott Woodward, he had this goal of 100,000 people tested, but it turns out we didn't need that many in order to do some of the things we wanted to do. And I think that's kind of the case here in that once we reach a certain point, it's almost like we've gathered the bulk of the genetics of the modern day population Mm. in a way. And because we all come from a much smaller, older population, it's almost as if we can piece together the DNA of that older generation or generations. And once we're able to really do that, and that's going to take more testing, but it will also take powerful computer databases and algorithms and computer science people. This isn't really even about genetics anymore, necessarily. It's about data and how to manage and extrapolate from data. So we need really strong, excited data scientists to take this on to help us uh, use the data that we have in in stronger and faster and better ways. And so I think that's really where we're headed. It's it's less about the laboratory techniques. It's less about getting more people tested. It's more about doing more with the data we have. So 
as you describe this, I'm trying to imagine what this would look like, where somehow the the data is analyzed and it says, well, your Y tells us this, and this is confirmed by this piece of your autosomal in this direction, which points us to these ancestors, that kind of thing. Yeah. And and more than that, it's that because I mean, what Ancestry is working on, what they've already said they're working on with their side view technology and all that they're doing to parse out again, they're they're taking their current data and doing more with it. Right. Mm -hmm. The data is sitting there waiting for us to do more with it, essentially. So one of the things Ancestry has done with their side view technology has been able to take your physical DNA and decide which parts of you came from your mom and which parts of you came from your dad with such a high level of confidence. Yes. That if you had all of your cousins, like your first cousins tested and they were able to do that with all of your first cousins, they would actually be able to pretty confidently reconstruct the DNA of your grandparents. Yeah, but not just your grandparents, because that wouldn't actually do us any good if yours were the only grandparents in the database, because everybody else would still be so distantly related to them because we're all young. Right. Yeah. So we need everybody's grandparents. It's essentially as if we could then get two generations further back, which could help us connect to the early 1700s, say, with autosomal. Right. That's where we're headed. That's wow. Where we're headed, Scott. She's we're Diane Southern. Yeah. She is your DNA guide. And Diane, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's thank been you, great Scott. to chat with you as always. I really enjoy your insight and the stories and your friendship. Thanks again. You're welcome and happy anniversary. Thank you so much. And coming up next, David Allen Lambert returns for another round of Ask Us Anything on Extreme Genes America's Family History Show. Hi, Genies. Fisher here, major fan of digitized newspapers. And how about a digitized newspaper site that has well over 800 million searchable pages? There is such a site. It's newspapers.com. They've got newspapers from all across the U.S., U.K., Canada, Australia, and beyond. This is where you'll find those remarkable stories, plus birth and marriage announcements, obituaries, photos, ads, and so much more. Newspapers.com is where I found my great aunt marriage announcement, which was huge since her marriage was not properly recorded. And then there's the story of one relative's 50th anniversary party in 1900, with a list of all the attendees and gifts. Newspapers.com is like that box of chocolates we always hear about. You never know what you're going to get. What will you find? Sign up now at Newspapers.com. Use the coupon code EXTREME at checkout to get a special extended 20% discount on a Publisher Extra subscription. Are you stuck in your genealogy research, frustrated by those brick walls that just won't budge, or confused by DNA test results and don't know where to begin? The experts at Legacy Tree Genealogists are here to help you find your missing ancestors and complete your family tree. With over 18 years of experience, Legacy Tree has assisted clients in every state and nearly every country worldwide. We have a vast network of on-site researchers, so no matter where your roots lie, we can work to uncover the answers you seek. Picture the thrill of making that long-awaited connection, finally discovering the missing link to your relatives. That's the joy Legacy Tree brings to countless clients just like you. Whether you're a beginning or seasoned researcher, brick walls happen. But with Legacy Tree by your side, that aha moment is within reach. Visit LegacyTree.com to learn more about how to work with Legacy Tree genealogists. Put your family history in our hands, and together, we'll unlock the stories of your past. Get started today at LegacyTree.com. Hey, Genies. As we've dug into our family history explorations over the past year, our community at Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies has taken off. This is where you can meet like-minded genealogists who can help you break through those brick walls and find a whole city behind it occupied by ancestors whose names you don't even know yet. This is where you can learn from your fellow genies and ask questions because many in our community have already been into some of the records you're looking for. Genealogy and Breakthrough Strategies is free. What a great place for brainstorming and getting to know other people who totally get your passion for family history research. If you're looking to take the next step in sharpening your skills, here's a great chance to learn from others and give back in areas you've already become expert in. So join us. That page again is Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough through strategies. It's a long name, but we cover a lot of territory. Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. (laughs) 
All right, we are back for Ask Us Anything on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show, and ExtremeGenes.com, our 10th anniversary show, and uh, David is back. David, this question comes from Ricky in Louisiana, and he says, Guys, this is for David. Can you give me some advice on how I can obtain a coat of arms for a couple of my British ancestors and a tartan for one of my Scottish ancestors? Interesting question. First of all, Dave, tell people what a tartan is. Sure. When you see a kilt for a particular person, they're usually wearing the tartan color for their family surname. So there's the McDonald, there's the McDonnell. I mean, it doesn't always have to have a Mick in front of it, but it's for clans. So it's essentially a clan tartan. So it would be the stylized material that's woven together. And then you'd wear it on a variety of things. A lady might wear it as a sash or a skirt, et cetera. Okay. A man will wear it as a kilt. Okay. Here's the problem with that. Not all surnames have one tartan. You might have multiple versions. There might be a northern version or a southern version Hmm. or a county version for a particular clan. In some cases, my wife's family made name Rennie. It was from the McRonalds family. Well, McRonalds was the family name probably in the Middle Ages. However, the Rennie family tartan, if I go online to order, was only created in the 1980s. (laughs) So it's for... Like you or I, if we wanted to say, all right, I want want a Fisher tartan and I'm Scottish or a Lambert family and I'm from Scotland, I want a tartan, you can have one designed. And with computer-aided stitching, it's probably even easier. But is it applicable to a family like my wife's who came over 100 years ago? Probably not. Yeah. But it is that surname. Now, on the flip side, a tartan can be applied to a surname, and usually you want to pick it regionally. But for a coat of arms, it's more specific. Fish, when you graduated through college and you got your diploma, yeah. your brother wasn't entitled to it. No. Your dad wasn't entitled no, to it. No, that's true. If you're getting a coat of arms, it's the same principle. So if you're granted a coat of arms to bear in battle or assigned by your peerage or you're being knighted, that coat of arms is only transferable to your descendants, not your siblings, not to your parents. Okay. So it means that if you're not descended from the person who received it, it's like going to a flea market and buying a photograph that has your last name in the back and saying, oh, that must be my ancestor. <laughs> it's the same principle. Okay. But it won't stop people from going to online malls and finding these little shopping spots in Disney World and a lot of places throughout the world where they'll, what's your last name? will give you your coat of arms with no direct parallel to even knowing who their immigrant ancestor is, let alone knowing who in the 14th century got that coat of arms. Wow. So with Lambert, there's dozens of coats of arms. And when I was 10 years old, I was that really punky kid that went over and said, can you tell me where my coat of arms comes from? And they're like, well, give me some family names. So I named like my parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents generation. And I mentioned my great-grandfather. Oh, James, it must be a family name. So here's a James Lambert got a coat of arms in 1512. It must have been passed down. Oh. Yeah, I mean, and for 1995, I could have had a T-shirt or a coffee mug. I mean, I, just, I don't know why I didn't spend the money. But, oh, you know, boy. in that respect, you can have coat of arms of the week. But true, there's a lot of serious work in coat of arms, and you can get them. For instance, in England, There's the College of Arms in London, and they can help you. They have a website, and there are plenty of websites online for searching for your Scottish tartan (laughs) so you can have your kilt made up for you. I'll bet. Oh, my gosh. It sounds like a thriving business, David. It really does, but I can tell you that I don't have a coat of arms, and I am not wearing a kilt. All right. Thank you very much. That's a good question. we got another one coming up here when we return with Ask Us Anything on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show, in three minutes. Back for our final segment on our 10th anniversary show on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. And, uh, David, you got the last question, and I'm getting this one from Manny in South Carolina. He says, Fisher, looking back 
on 10 years of the show, what are some of the most memorable stories you have had on? <laughs> Boy, David, where do we start with this? Because there have wow. been so many I mean, of them. Some of them are like surprising. Some of them are like shocking. Yeah. Some of them make you cry. And some of them just make me laugh for days. I oh, mean, yeah. I don't know. It's hard to pick. Well, if, if you're new to the show and you listen to the podcast, I would recommend you go to our podcast archives at ExtremeGenes.com mm-hmm. and go back to episode 100, which <laughs> to me was the most incredible story we've ever had in 10 years. And this was the one where the man found out that he was one of nine kids that had eight dads. That was quite a story. The other one that comes to mind was really recent, just a few mm-hmm. weeks ago. The strange happenings with the exhumations of the DeWitt family in Kingston, New York. Cherk Clayson DeWitt, mm-hmm. his wife Barbara, his daughter Tatcha, and his son Andres, and all the things that have been happening to the people who were part of that for the last year. That's pretty nutty. Do you remember the story, David, of the woman who died, was exhumed for some reason like four years later and found in perfect condition? And and so they had a second viewing for her in front of her former husband and the husband's new wife. That was a pretty good one. Yeah. And then I think just having like quarterback Steve Young on the show, the Hall Mm -hmm. of Famer from the NFL, having Apollo Anton Ono on the show. That was a highlight. Marilou Henner, shortly after oh, you gosh. started coming on the show. Well, Global Family Reunion, that's where we met her. That's, she was great. That's right. She was fantastic. And, of course, she has that photographic memory. She remembers everything, which is kind of mm-hmm. insane. So those are some of the stories. But I really love finding out about just people's everyday discoveries. How about some of the eBay discoveries? We had somebody in Northern England reach out, and they'd heard on the show about using eBay to find family things, and they located the medals of their great uncle who was killed in World War I on eBay, mm-hmm. and he spent like $400 getting that material to the objections of his wife, but wound up taking it and putting it up proudly on his wall. I mean, to me, that would be an incredible find. I think we need to get a kickback from eBay for all these things that we've actually had people go and search for and buy now. Well, that's true. It's not a real often thing. You don't find things on eBay constantly as an individual, but collectively we're hearing things all the time that people find, which always Mm -hmm. gives the rest of us hope. I haven't had an eBay find right now in probably two years relating yeah, to the but, family but you're going to do it tonight when uh, <laughs> you go off the recording and find something and i'll talk about it with you next week you never know how that's going to happen so you know those are some of the things that are fun and i love personally hearing about other people's discoveries what they've found how they've done it and sharing those things with you so that you can learn a little from it i can learn a little from it mm-hmm. and we can all benefit from sharing each other's knowledge and experiences this has been the great thing of 10 years of this show I know that the show has kept the sanity and the laughter going for a lot of people, especially (laughs) during COVID. And I know people that will binge listen to like six months of the show and come and say, oh, I love this. And a lot of the times it's the same shows that I remember doing. That's it. A year, two, three years ago. Well, David, thanks so much for all your contributions. You've been on for the last eight years, which is unbelievable. I enjoy every moment of it, my friend. All right, my friend. You have a great week, and we'll talk to you again next time. Until later. And that is our show for this week, Genies. Thank you once again for 10 years of support of Extreme Genes. We continue on. Of course, if you missed any of this episode, catch the podcast on Apple Media, ExtremeGenes.com, Spotify, TuneIn Radio. We are all over the place. Talk to you again next week. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. 